Thank you very much everyone for coming here today to hear this event from the Oxford Guild Business Society at the Oxford Union. Uh, today we're very fortunate to have with us Hugh Sloan, who's co-founder of hedge fund Sloan Robinson, which is set up in 1993. Hugh's a former Oxford student himself and he'll be giving us an insight into the world of hedge funds and hopefully be talking about some of his own experiences and lessons learned and answering some of your questions. Thanks very much. The, um, well, I'm very flattered to be here, and it's, uh, I've already met quite a few of you, so um, thank you for the very warm welcome. Um, I'm a bit nervous, because I'm sure that very often the, uh, the people who sit in my position are you know, right at the top of their, of their profession, um, and without any false modesty, I want to tell you that um, that doesn't really apply to me. I've got a lot of experience. Um, but I wouldn't want you to, to think uh, that, that, um, uh, uh, that I'm at the pinnacle of, uh, of anything at all. Um, I did my first degree in Bristol, uh, where I read economics and politics, and then I read um, uh, maths and economics here. Um, <clears throat> and then I uh, worked for a, an English partnership in Hong Kong and Japan for 15 years, which was... Uh, very good fun. I left here in 1979, um, uh, and then I set up um, uh, Sloan Robinson in 1993, which actually quite a good year, right at the bottom of the business cycle, uh, to establish um, a financial boutique. Um, what is a hedge fund? The, uh, the most sensible way, and it's cynical, is to say that it's um, a charging mechanism in search of an investment strategy. And the, the fees are, are, have been very successful over a, a very high over a long period of time. But it's, it's really tough to, to, to um, summarize what these, um, these financial boutiques are. Uh, the common points are, are very moderate. They're, they're new. Not, not many, many of them are more than 30 years old. Uh, they're not remotely close to being a bank or an insurance company. Uh, their customers are all wealthy individuals or their um, uh, financial intermediaries. Uh, they, they're closely associated with the, with the founders, not least because the founders invest generally, or almost always, invest their own money alongside their clients. Uh, they charge performance fees. They try to make absolute returns, and, and they're regulated. So not much, to, um, not much granularity there. And other than that, the um, hedge funds are pretty heterogeneous. The, um, uh, they invest in a very wide range of, um, uh, of securities, uh, every part of uh, a firm's capital structure, every derivative thereof. Uh, they invest in commodities, government liabilities, including currencies. Uh, they, they can use leverage. Some, some firms use uh, an enormous amount of borrowing. Um, you know, gearing of 15 to 1 wouldn't be, wouldn't be unusual. Most, you might be surprised to learn, use, um, use very little. Uh, they have very different holding periods, um, ranging from a few seconds uh, to several years. So there's some, you can't say, make, make any generalizations there. Uh, they can go short, and um, I think that's what, uh, in the media's view, that's what hedge, hedge funds do, and that's what they're most famous for. But I assure you, it's really hard to make money uh, on, on the short side, and most people, most investors, uh, tend not to um, uh, uh, tend not to, to, to make a, a big deal of this or, or focus on it. Um, so it's it's hard to define these wretched funds by um, what they do, how they do it, or what their objectives are. So it's no wonder that they're viewed sort of skeptically by the by the public. Uh, you don't get much further in defining hedge funds if you ask who they are. I mean, who sets them up? Um, there are certainly more than 15,000 of these funds um, uh, over, uh, around, around the world. They're not, they're not the same 15,000 from, um, uh, from year to year, but it's an incredibly eclectic mix of, of people, um, with two exceptions, I mean, two, two gener generalizations. Unfortunately, relatively few um, women set up uh, hedge funds, and the... Uh, the general rule is for the, the founding partners of, um, of these funds to have a degree 
of, uh, of financial independence. And they don't generally get that until they're around sort of 35. So you know, most of these funds are set up by, uh, by men, not women, but men of any, you know, any all around the world uh, in, in their mid-30s. Um, I've already had uh, a lot of uh, discussions of um, for people about how do, how do you get started as a, as a, as a hedge fund manager. And the, um, it's, it's not easy. This is, the, uh, this is the, the barrier to entry in the, uh, in the business, if, if there is one. Uh, you can start with any amount of money you like, I mean, any small amount. Some people start with five million, but you absolutely, you really need to have a hundred million dollars um, of, uh, of backing. And to do that, um, you need to get a track record somewhere. You can, so you've got to persuade, you can, it, it's fine to have friends uh, you know, rabbits, friends, and relations, and they can probably contribute you know, a few million dollars at most, maybe five, maybe ten. But you, you, you need some institutional support in one form or another. You need some support from uh, a wealth management company or private banks or, or some high net worth individuals. And in order to persuade them of the risk of doing, uh, that, that, that the risk is worth taking, you've, you've got to um, uh, establish a track record at a well-known firm. So, you know, if, if you really want to work in financial services, I'm not sure it's that good an idea now, but um, then the best thing to do is go and work for Schroeder's or Fidelity and establish a track record there and, once, and make sure that it's, it's, it's uh, clearly attributed to you uh, and network like hell, and then you might be able to um, uh, establish uh, a business um, on your own. The... Um, so if you're if you're lucky and talented, you get you get started. And but the the first three years are fairly tough. I mean, obviously these are these are huge generalizations. Um, but if you stay in the game, it's um, it's pretty lucrative. So once you've started, once you've got your hundred million, very few funds, other funds will will invest with you. Uh, uh, wealth managers will invest with you until you've got a three-year track record. So established, having established your, your track record um, with Schroeder's or whoever, you then, you've then got to do it again by, by yourself. But let's say that you, uh, and by the way, office costs will, and employment costs will be about a million dollars uh, a year. It's, it's hard to do it a lot cheaper than that. But let's say that you can make, um, you find yourself being able to make 20% a year for, for three years. Uh, it's hard, but if you do it, then the performance fees from that will be worth uh, about $10 million to you and your, your partner. Um, and with that record, uh, you can start to grow your business. And over the next five years, you, might, um, you should aim to get to about $2 billion under management. And in the, in the process, uh, you will have had about $200 million um, to share amongst the partnership. So really considerable amounts of money. Uh, and then from there, if you can get to $10 billion over the, the next five years, uh, you most probably, the partnership will most probably earn a minimum of, um, well, let's say $1.5 billion over that, um, that period. And, and then you can uh, look at uh, earning between $250 and $500 million a year. So it's, uh, it, it's very hard to get there, but... Um, I thought it would be interesting for you to, if I just put some, some numbers on it. Uh, it can be much better than that. The, um, the most famous uh, fund managers that you're, you're aware of, people like George Soros, um, have compounded about 30% a year for 30 years. So you can you know, think of all those, all those numbers, or think of the numbers I just gave you. And, and approximately double them. Um, his uh, partner, who's a chap called Stan Druckenmiller, uh, has been even more successful than that. It's about 35% a year for, uh, for 25 years. Um, Paul Tudor Jones, uh, the numbers I gave you before were on a, a performance a fee of 1% management fee and 20% performance fee. Uh, Paul Tudor Jones charges 3 and 30. Um, and he's been in, in around for, for 30 years. 
and the largest hedge fund in, in the UK is run by, um, uh, it's called Brevin Howard, and there the management fee is um, uh, 3% 3, 3 and 20. So they, at the moment, they run about um, uh, just under $30 billion at that, um, at that rate. Um, I don't know what people really, um, really think of, uh, of these, these guys, but uh, we, should, we should think of them as the, as the financial equivalents of, um, of giants uh, of, of academia. So in an economic sense, these, the, the people I've mentioned would be analogous to um, uh, Stiglitz, Merleys, Amartya Sen, um, people are really, by the way, they, they all taught me when I was here, so I was incredibly fortunate. Um, they are really at the pinnacle of their, uh, uh, of their, their professional lives. Um, now, I said at the start that uh, I felt rather nervous about um, um, making this presentation because, because my performance is nothing like that. I, I charge, uh, or I've charged, my, I, my partners have charged a 1% management fee and 15% uh, performance fee, and uh, uh, our performance over 20 years is about 15 or 15 to 20 percent compound in um, in the several strategies uh, that I that I run. <clears throat> and when I left Oxford, hedge funds were like sushi. Uh, nobody had ever heard of them. <laughs> and, no, and the uh, 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 the the financial changes since um, since then are really quite remarkable. So. Um, this might amuse you. Beer cost 25p. Uh, most students got by on £750 a year. Life membership of the union cost five quid. Uh, the, um, uh, a good starting salary paid um, £3,000, and you could buy a two bed apart uh, apartment in Notting Hill for £50,000. Um, banks were very small, there were more than 50 of them and they're extremely well regulated. Uh, insider trading was utterly rife. Uh, the f I, when I left Oxford, I went to, uh, went to Hong Kong, and my first lunch with, um, sort of my first corporate lunch was with the, um, uh, with the head of the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, a very jovial chap called uh, Mickey Mock. Uh, Mickey had two wives, which um, because you were allowed to, you, you were allowed to do that in Hong Kong up until 1972. And somebody asked him what uh, what uh, what he thought about the the moves in England then in in, in the city then to uh, uh, to outlaw um, insider trading. And he looked rather askance. He said, "Oh, what the fuck they think it's stock market for." <laughs> 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 uh, the, the city then was, um, uh, was re regarded as a, a national asset, and hardly anyone applied to it. Um, the most popular job uh, in 1979 um, was, to, was to become a research assistant uh, for the BBC, uh, which paid a colossal sum of £3,200 a year. Uh, there were 500 applicants from Oxbridge for two places then. And um, there was jo lots of, of jostling and whatever to get an appropriate CV, so there's nothing new under the sun. Um, the biggest change, though, I think, is um, uh, that now the, there is no insider trading, to all intents and purposes. Uh, and the banks are now appallingly regulated. Um, and financial services are incredibly popular with bright graduates, uh, and yet we're reviled by the public. The um, financial services have really come to uh, epitomize some of the worst aspects, I'm not sure there are any good aspects, of the, uh, uh, of the financial crash, financial crisis, and um, are in it for the time being are inextricably linked with um, discussion about inequality, uh, which is the rallying cry uh, of our time. I did make, make a couple of assertions which we can, we can discuss afterwards if you, if you like, but you know, hedge funds, which really small boutiques, financial boutiques, um, were 
mainly observers in, in the financial crash. Uh, many people were not, um, uh, didn't even participate, many, many hedge funds didn't even participate in it and were, um, uh, they certainly weren't a cause of it. But the main causes were, were certainly, the, um, certainly the banks, but it's amazing how uh, lightly the regulators got off firm. Uh, with, with this. So, you know, hedge funds, like all these banks, are regulated to the hilt, and um, yeah, the UK regulator that Northern Rock, if, I don't know if you, any of you remember it, but Northern Rock went down, it's, it was um, more than 50 times leverage, and, uh, and it is evidently not getting any better. Because, I mean, look at, look at the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the chairman of the co-op. I mean, it's an absolutely ridiculous uh, figure who didn't even know how big his, what the size of his bank was. Um, so, I, you know, I'm sure that hedge funds alleged, uh, alleged links to um, uh, the financial crisis will, uh, uh, I, I think that will pall over, over, over time. Um, but inequality is much more controversial, and, and you, you probably read Paul... Krugman and, um, and, and Thomas Piketty, they, they, they argue that inequality represents a, uh, a failure of, of capitalism and the top 1% uh, of which all hedge fund managers, if they've been successful, certainly in, that they should be crushed. Um, well, who am I to, uh, you know, to try and gain, say, uh, the illustrious um, uh, Paul, um, Paul Krugman? Um, but the, uh, a cat can look at the king, and I'd just like to make a few observations. Um, because Krugman especially, and Piketty, in, I mean, Piketty's book is, is going to be rather like um, uh, a brief history of time. Everyone will know it, and no one will have read it. It's 600 pages, but it, I have been through, through parts of it, uh, and it's, it's very deep in, um, in statistical analysis. But if I can just make a few observations, the um, inequality has been uh, going up in the UK and America since the mid-1970s. If you do a word check in the, for the FT uh, or the Asian Wall Street Journal uh, for Gini coefficient, you will find no mention of this between 1975 and 2010. Or, and, or, or negligible mention. Um, but since then, uh, the use of the word Gini coefficient, which you all know about, uh, has soared. I mean, it's just it's escalated. So it, it, the, the chart is, is flat, it's dead, and it only springs to life over the last five years. At a time when actually in, um, uh, in, inequalities in the UK and America have not got noticeably worse, the time that they got much, um, much worse, if that's the, if that's the right word, uh, was during the, um, the 1990s and, uh, and, and 2000s. Um, the, the surprising thing is that the increase in inequality is wholly global. Uh, I think I'm right in saying, funnily enough, the CIA has a really good uh, database on this. Um, but I think I'm right in saying that the only company, the country in the world that, um, uh, where inequalities have not increased since 1975 is, um, is Holland, <coughs> is the Netherlands. Um, there are some real surprises. So I, I doubt that any of us would have predicted that um, uh, inequalities would rise uh, in South Africa after apartheid, but they certainly have. And they are much bigger. Um, the Gini coefficient for, for South Africa is about 57, and in the UK it's about, it's about 35. So inequalities within, um, uh, within countries have got, uh, uh, have got worse, uh, but no one really cared about it until five years ago. Uh, inequalities between countries have got hugely better over that period. And it's really worth focusing on this. So Krugman might, might argue that um, uh, income inequalities threatened the, um, uh, 
the American dream, and I can, anyone can see why, why he would say that. Um, but if you're a global citizen, I don't think you take quite the same, uh, quite the same approach. And the fact that, um, that in inequalities have got, um, got worse over 30 years against a huge plethora of different fiscal policies and different monetary policies over those periods, uh, and that it's common to almost all countries, uh, suggests that it's not something, you, you don't want to be looking at the demand side or fiscal policy, but it could be supply side changes. And the two issues that are most prevalent, most likely in my view, are globalization and very, very rapid technological progress. And I just to sort of put this out really as a, because I have some, some other sort of deep, deep, um, deeply held views that you know, inequality is, is, part of, is, is most likely to be, not, not to be a failure of, um, of, uh, of capitalism, but a failure of education. You know, the, ben the basic tenet of, of capitalism is that through investment you improve productivity and you need higher educated people to work, you know, to, to access the, the machines and keep going. In, um, in the problem now is that it's very easy to, to access uh, uh, better educated, cheaper people, and they're accessible as a result of globalization. And before anyone, anyone thinks, well, we'll, we'll row back on, on globalization, I utterly assure you that that would be the, you know, be careful what you wish for. This, this, would, this would generate the worst uh, financial, global financial crisis since, since the 1930s. And, and actually, not, not even um, Piketty uh, suggests that. In a very narrow sense, the, um, we are all part of this, uh, uh, our educational background is all, is all part of this trend towards, um, uh, towards uh, higher inequalities. Uh, educated people, the, and the facts are simple and it's true all over the world, that educated people work longer hours and they have a longer working life. And, and we tend to partner with better educated people. So, which, which clearly risks sort of in, in, exacerbating the trend. It's worth, worth thinking on, on, on those things. Now the, 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 the main fact is that it doesn't really matter what the, um, what the stats show or what the causes of, uh, of inequality have been. Um, as, as far as the political debate is, is concerned. I mean, the, you know, we've moved on a long way from, from when Peter Mendelssohn said in this country that he was intensely relaxed about uh, people getting filthy rich. And the fact is that, that the media and normal people, whatever that means, you know, just cannot stomach the fact that um, uh, British banks were, were bailed out by the taxpayer and now they're paying, paying themselves very large bonuses. And, it, and I, I have some, some sympathy with this. So what, what might we do about this as a, as a, in a practical measure? Um, I have to say that, that Krugman and um, Piketty's uh, proposals well, there aren't very many proposals. They're mainly, they're, their approach is mainly descriptive and not prescriptive. Uh, but, but the proposals they have are wholly reactionary, in my view. So they, they argue for very high marginal tax rates, 80%, and a global wealth tax, you know, like mom and pop and apple pie. A, a global wealth tax will never happen. You, know, you can just forget it. And the, I mean, the trend in, in, in most countries is to reduce taxes on wealth, not increase it. Uh, and I think they know it. So, but I, I think that there, there, are, um, there really are three or four things, that, or three things that, that, that we could suggest. And it will come back to you know, the role, sort of, the role of, um, of financial boutiques and, and hedge funds. The, one of the, the, the features of, of inequality which seems to press hardest and most probably resonates uh, with a lot of you is, is, is how on earth to buy a house. And you know, believe me, these things are very expensive. Well, the answer is because the relative price of housing has gone up much faster than any, and everything else. And the answer is, um, is blindingly clear, which we should build more houses. Now, if you don't like the environmental uh, impact of this, 
then examine uh, immigration policy or live in smaller, smaller houses. Neither of these are, are particularly attractive, but it does, you know, it does force the, 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 sort of the political choice here that you, if you're going to, to uh, uh, if you're going to address uh, inequalities sensibly, then, then people's, most people's the price of most people's largest asset has to come down. So I think that's, um, that's important. Uh, the next thing, the, the next proposal was, um, was actually proposed by, um, uh, by Jim Murleys uh, in the, uh, the Murleys uh, review of taxation uh, last year. I can't think why it hasn't got more, um, more public support. It's um, essentially to abolish death duties. Uh, the death duties for rich people are wholly voluntary. You should replace it with uh, a tax on lifetime gifts. And then, then there's really nothing that, that, and it's a very strange tax. It's the only tax where the beneficiary doesn't pay. Um, and then we, we need a sort of, I, I think this will, this will take a change as, you know, that, would, that will rival the, the Renaissance, but we, we, we need to be much more competitive about, um, uh, about our economy, uh, about our, our, our education. I mean, those useless tables that you know, rank schools in, in the UK, is, we, we, should, we need to be thinking about, about this in, in a global context. And yes, I think it would have more, uh, more selection, but we, we should focus on, on broad education in a, in a way which is really forward-looking and recognises the, um, uh, the educational competition uh, for, for that's uh, going to be around for, uh, for the foreseeable future. Now, I want to finish with two pieces of, um, of sort of broad, broad advice, and it may surprise you that the financial um, uh, the, peop the people I mentioned who are at the the, uh, the pinnacle of their uh, financial careers and their academic careers are at, in, a, in a in a tangible way are um, uh, are very similar. I don't know how many of you have read the um, have read Black Swan. It's um, it's a very it's a very long book. It's only worth reading the first uh, uh, the first chapter. But both um, both education and um, hedge fund uh, management uh, are scalable occupations. And what this I think most of you know what, what that means. But for those of you who who don't, it, the anyone who does um, uh, who runs who's in, in, in a manual occupation, and all professions, including the oldest, uh, the incomes from these can be uh, normally distributed. And so it means that if we, if we were a group of doctors and a, and, and doctor, a random doctor walked into the room, um, he wouldn't affect the statistical characteristics of the incomes of, the, of this group. But scalable occupations, Included, include actresses and software writers and academics in the sense of how many times they are cited and, and hedge fund managers. So if we're, if we're a bunch of soft, software writers and Bill Gates walks through the room, you know, you know what happens. We're a bunch of academics and Marty Sen walks through the room, you, you, you know what, so what happens. The, it does change the, the, the characteristics of this, uh, uh, of, of this group. Now, the problem with, um, with applying to scalable occupations is that most people who get there live in hope. Because not everyone can get to, get to the pinnacle. And, and the process that I outlined in, in a hedge fund, um, in the hedge fund uh, industry is pretty brutal. I mean, there are lots and lots of people who'd, who'd like to earn a billion and a half dollars over, over five years. And how many do? It's, it's, a, it's a negligible few. Um, I think it's the same is true with academics. You know, lots of people would, be like, would, would, would like to be like um, uh, Joe Stiglitz, but they, they live in hope, and it's mainly a, a forlorn hope. So the, the tangible um, recommendation here, if, this is not for any, any individual, but for, for a group of people like, like, um, like yourselves, and, and is to become... Uh, a professional is, is to ride in these guys' 
um, coats, on, on these guys' coats' tails. So you know, be a professional in a scalable activity. So you know, be the accountant to the rock star. Uh, be the um, interior designer to the, the software writer. Be the legal um, uh, advisor for, for hedge funds. I said at the, at the start, it's rather odd that, that, that um, uh, women who are, ab it's absolutely clear that women are, you know, are very strong investors over time, but they choose not to take the risks um, associated with setting up their, your, your, own, your own hedge fund. But all of these funds are cram jammed full of, um, of, uh, of women professionals on the legal side, on the marketing side, on the analytical side. And it's a perfectly coherent and straightforward way, way to, uh, uh, to approach uh, your career. Um, oh, I, get that. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. The, um, <laughs> the, the, the last thing is um, a, a bit of uh, advice which I think is, is more homegrown. The, um, if you... If, in spite of what I've said, you, you still think that a, a career in financial services and, and hedge funds is, you know, might, might be for you, um, ask yourself if you're a perfectionist. And if you are, uh, I, would, I would recommend that you think twice about doing it. Um, there's nothing wrong with being a perfectionist, perfectionist but it, it, it's not very congruent with, with a, a career in financial services. With financial services, that career is defined by making decisions under uncertainty. And I've seen lots of highly intelligent, uh, clear-eyed people who turned out to be per perfectionists, very frustrated uh, with their, life, their lives in financial services because you know, they have to evaluate a company or a decision rather quickly, and whereas they prefer to have more, you know, more information. So there are any number of other routes you, that you can take, but, the, um, but financial services are not... Um, uh, is not one. Um, well, I think that's about it. I'm, I'm reminded the um, uh, Mark Twain. Of course, it's Mark Twain. It's always Mark Twain, isn't it? <laughs> he said, it's, 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 "It's better to remain silent and thought a fool uh, than open one's mouth and remove all doubt." So, with that in mind, I wonder if any of you have some. Uh, nice <laughs> questions. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. <laughs> well, don't be put off. The um, we. We interview uh, quite a lot of people at, from, from Oxford for uh, uh, positions in our, in our firm. One of the questions we ask, ask them is, is um, what's the population of America? How many of you definitely know? <laughs> okay, how many of you definitely know? So there's one man here, he knows. 315 million. Okay, that's, that's good enough. The, um, the answers go from 50 million to a billion to that's not fair. <laughs> and, I mean, we've had so many Chinese students who think that America must be you know, a billion people. <laughs> because it's, because it, it, it is what it is. The, um, I, I was asked earlier what the, uh, what the best thing that I did in, in my career was, and, and certainly it was to go to... Uh, uh, when, I, when I left Oxford to, to, go to, to go to Asia. And um, I spent uh, 15 years there, first as, a, as an economist, which was in, in some ways the best job I had. I was, um, uh, there were no computers then, there were no databases, so I had to main, maintain a, a database on, on 11 uh, economies in Asia, manually, uh, with, with, with two, um, two people help, helping me. I, the only thing in my life that I've, I've been expert on is um, uh, central bank publications, monthly monthly bulletins, which which give the details of the uh, uh, of the of the business cycle, and I, I sort of plotted these carefully. And I had I had three things to do. First, I contributed to a, uh, to a 
to a now defunct, I'm not surprised, um, uh, economics paper called Asian Monetary Monitor. Um, and then I made some initially childish, and, uh, but then better, progressively better recommendations, stock market recommendations and bond market recommendations on relative to, to where these countries were in, in the business cycle. And uh, the third thing was that the partners of this company, it was called GT Management, um, thought that this was a, this was a, a hard job. And, and in some ways it, it was. But, so, and this is how, how it was in, in the, the, the very early 1980s. They, they said, right, Hugh, off, you know, every six weeks you can go anywhere you like in Asia and, um, uh, to build up your, your network. Um, and that was so much fun. You know, a 23 year old English boy being let loose in Asia was, was a lot of fun. But the, you know, the, the, the people that I met at the Bank of Japan in 1979 are now on the, on the policy board or head of, and, and, and Peter Johnson, who ran the, uh, uh, the Reserve Bank of Australia until recently, is, you know, was, was a friend of mine when I was, you know, he was 20, 28 and I was 25. So it was a, it was a, an absolutely fantastic start. And I think that, you know, with, with that, it, it provided a, um, uh, a laboratory for examining economies. And I think, you know, that, that skill stayed with me for, for a long time. Yeah, there's one question. Yeah, I was just uh, thinking, how is the hedge fund industry going to adapt if, say, Britain does remain in the European Union? when a lot of the legislation is targeting uh, unconventional funds, such as hedge funds? Yeah, it, I mean, it's, it's a, a very strong observation. The, um, uh, much of this uh, legislation is, um, is originated by the ex-socialist um, Prime Minister of, of Denmark, Paul, Paul Rasmussen. And, I mean, he's, he's a a deeply unattractive man, <laughs> in my view. And uh, they, he, he alleges that, that um, these boutiques are, uh, are a, uh, a threat to, to uh, systemic uh, stability. It's complete nonsense. The, the, no hedge fund in, um, uh, in the UK has gone bust. No hedge fund anywhere has, has been has had to be bailed out with um, with public money. Though I agree that long term, whatever it was in in 1998, temporarily looked as if it might require uh, a loan from from the Fed. Um, so he's um, you know his well, it's just the politics of greed and uh, the politics of, of envy. I think. I mean it, it, he's, these these um, these, these institutions are small but lucrative. They're not institutions. These boutiques are small but lucrative. Sir? Uh, yeah, sorry, I don't have a deep, uh, smart question. Uh, but you mentioned the interview question about the population in America. Uh, what do I need to do for you to give me a job this summer? <laughs> <laughs> okay. The other. You're, you're, you're very welcome to try. The, um, <laughs> the, the, other, the other question that we ask is, um, and this is, quite, this is interesting, I think. What, um, in in uh, 50 years ago, uh, Guyana and South Korea were equally wealthy. And now, you know, now look, at the, look at the difference. And, our, and we ask people, what, what accounts for, what do they think accounts for, for the difference over, over that period? Well, it's a bit unfair because the, hardly anyone knows where Guyana is. <laughs> it doesn't matter, you know. It could be, I mean, it could have been, it could have been Ghana, all right? And I don't really know what the answer is, but I think it's, it's to do with what the policies were that were uh, enacted in these countries 50 years ago. So Ghana after, which is a good example, Ghana after independence, the first country to be in, in 1957, I think, it decided that, that uh, what it must do is, is to be totally the opposite of, um, of its colonial structure. And it would be independent in everything. So it tried to have a, an independent um, steel, steel business, independent car business, independent, uh, 
you know, all, all of these. Well, of course, it was ridiculous, and Ghana is, you know, condemned itself for, to a generation of, of poverty. Whereas if you, you know, if you specialize and trade and, and have freedom of, of law and of rule of law and good education, you know, then you can then you can you can become uh, wealth, sort of wealthy rather rather quickly. So they all struggle through this. And my next question is, is then: Okay, so should Scotland secede? And well, here's your chance. Um, well, to say that, I'm actually not going to have to debate. I was talking to the panelists last night. Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I lived there for four years. Uh, so the answer is no. Okay, and but the real answer. Sorry about the job, but the real answer. <laughs> <laughs> the, real, the real answer is it depends what it does with its independence. You know, so if, if it was to become a, 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 um, a Switzerland in the, in the North Sea, it could, in 25 years, it could be twice as rich as the UK, as, as, as England. If it does what I suspect Salmon would, would do, you know, then Scotland is, is going to be in deep trouble for a while. Yeah. I guess that's kind of related. There is, there's, a, there's a kind of problem in the sense that, sure, short term, countries like Scotland will profit very, very much so. Um, I from mean, what? The, uh, from, from North Sea oil um, and, and other industries. But the, the, there's a. There's you don't want to mention North Sea oil if you want. No, <laughs> but there is there is there is an inherent difficulty with if you are lacking resources and the only thing you can turn to is, is services, and if you don't have um, an environment where you. Well, but that's the point about South Korea. I mean, it, it doesn't have it doesn't have any resources other than coal or Hong Kong. No resources whatsoever. No. They operate as trading. Hub. Exactly. They, but they've Scotland got Singapore. <laughs> You, know, you don't. You, you absolutely don't need resources to be to become wealthy. And, and, and the sort of you know the factor endowment approach to uh, economic development is it will never get to that. So uh, uh, Texas and Mexico are essentially the same when it comes to to, to factor endowments. But look at look at them now. Yes. Yes. Um, I love job, job related question. <laughs> um, I, you mentioned education as something very important. And I was just wondering um, if you think hedge funds could improve education in any way and how they could contribute to educational systems as opposed to like government programs. Well, uh, if it's possible. No, I think, I mean, I think it's wholly possible. The. Um, uh, So almost all reasonably successful, and certainly the most successful hedge fund managers that you, you know, um, are the most bounteous um, uh, philanthropists you come across. So, I, don't, I mean, I would hazard a guess that George Soros has given away $10 billion. Um, what we do, and a lot of other people do, so we have five um, graduate scholarships, 10 at Lincoln, five at Keeble, we support um, scholarships at Latimer Upper School, Rugby School, and Eton. We do well. Anyway, that's a good start. <laughs> and we can, uh, but I mean, these these things are all. I, I just state that that um, the I mean the, the city has a, uh, a a reputation for greed and. Actually, just, the fact is, it just makes quite a lot of money from time to time, but it gives a, a huge amount of this away. You're, you're um, next to you. Oh, go on. Uh, sorry, I just wanted to ask, um, do you think it could also target teachers as opposed to students, like the, um, the sponsorship or things like that to improve kind of the teaching as opposed to... Well, you can, you can in higher education. It's, it's, um, it's very difficult to, do, to target that in... Um, uh, in, within the state system, I mean, you, you, the amount of, uh, of um, recidivism that you, you would get from the, from the unions is pretty dramatic. If you if you've got an idea on that, that I mean, that's no, that, I mean that's a really good idea. 
Just next year. Yes, yes, sir. You mentioned the importance of policy in the financial markets and the prospects of countries like you said with the, the difference between South Korea and Guyana. Um, yeah. And obviously the importance of government policy like in driving the market factors is currently very big and QE in that. Yeah. Do you see that continuing in the future, that increase in the importance of a government policy in driving or like a market? Or um, do you see that as more of a slight uh, cool. it's, it's hard to answer your question in, in, uh, in a short time. Anyway, it's, all, it's absolutely clear that, um, in my view, that, that QE will end in tears for as far as the financial markets are, are concerned. Because either one, either of one of two things will happen. Firstly, the, the, um, the, the uh, central bankers re um, behave uh, responsibly and begin to raise rates as wage rates picks up, raise it, raise some interest rates as, as wage rates pick up, and I think that that would. I mean, Wall Street is it trades at about fifty percent more; its valuation is about fifty percent higher than the um, than, than the long term norms. So I mean that that should tell you something, or much more likely, and the um, I think this is by far the biggest threat. That, uh, uh, that the the central banks are supine and um, are ostentatiously <coughs> behind the curve, and inflationary expectations pick up, and then the markets will, would really be in trouble. Yeah, but, yeah, the I had the enormous good fortune to start uh, start my career the um, the same week that Paul Volcker. Um, began his, uh, his, his policy of disinflation. And disinflation and deregulation were the keynotes of the, of the, um, uh, of the, of the bull market in, in America in the 1980s and, and the 1990s. Um, the, the position that we're, that we're in, uh, and, and Wall Street was trading on a book value and six times earnings. Well, you know, now we're a completely the opposite end of the spectrum. So I'm, I'm, I'm not surprised that financial services are attractive to, to, to smart graduates because, the, because the, the incomes are high and because it's a very interesting thing to do. But the timing is appalling. Um, yeah. Yes? Thank so. you very much um, for sharing your insights. Uh, I couldn't see the view from here. Um, a particular question around your trajectory, so I guess starting the fund and as the fund has grown, also prior to your, um, I guess your corporate employment, how much of your own capital did you actually deploy into the business at what point in time? I mean, not necessarily the amount, but most of the relative size of your own wealth did you put into the business? All of it. I mean, all of all of the, um, uh, all, all of my my financial worth. So not not I did. I mean, I didn't. Mortgage the house, but but otherwise, <laughs> otherwise all, all of it. Yeah. Um, so you, this is another policy question. Um, you touched on policy, but you also touched on Japan, um, and with recent changes in Japanese um, fiscal policy, on um, or rather as a result of disappointing um, equity markets as of sort of like the first quarter, um, do you see that with firms with um, a lot of exposure to Japanese equity margins. Um, do you find that in the future, perhaps in the short to medium term, there'll be a almost a capital flight further west? Um, I'm in, I'm one of those funds. China. The um, that, I mean, you're so smart. The the uh, the only exception to my sort of you know generally I mean, cautious view of, um, of of how to position yourself is is in Japan and China, and. Um, so, in case you don't know, the, the, I'm sure, sure you all know this, but you know, the Japanese market rallied 65% um, uh, from the lows um, in uh, the autumn of 2012 up until the end of last year and has fallen by uh, 15 or 16% since, since then. But it, it won't fall very much more, I think, and sincerely hope. 
So, I mean, this is, that's, that's a market that's right, it's at the, completely the other end of the, um, uh, of the policy and valuation matrix uh, to the US. Yes, please. Yeah, so I'm actually from South Korea, so I'm just quite interested in the <laughs> about what sort of policy actually got to. What sort of policy? So basically you're saying that it was government policy which got the South Korea off the ground. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, was. From my view, so I know, I know the history quite well, and, and I thought it was just a dictator just came in and said, let's just get rich. Um, well, it's, it but it was the same. It, it was the yeah. same. So. Um, what was his name? President Chun. Um, Park. Park. Yeah. Pre 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 President Park. And uh, but it, it, he he had a, a political dictatorship, but but he fostered um, infant industries and free trade, and there was very strong rule of law. That, I mean, he basically adopted the uh, the, the U.S. Um, program for property rights. And, and told, told the Chabols to get on with it. Yeah, well, and as a consequence of that, well, it's kind of one's going to be extreme end of a capitalist country, I think. So each party got involved at the time that became the richest people, and the gaps that became, became larger. Okay, so yeah. I mean, I, I mean, yeah. South, South Korea is, is a really good example of where inequalities have, have risen, but, but everyone's got richer. I mean, I, you're, you're, you're right what you say. The, I mean, he, he, the President Park um, chose a you know, pretty brutal approach to, to, to this, and, and he didn't um, track any, any opposition. But I think most people would rather, rather have had that, most Koreans would rather have that than be in Ghana. Yeah. Uh, yes? I have my, um, my own brewery account, and I see what's right. I have my own money. Do you have any just general advice? <laughs> <laughs> well, ad hoc financial advice. Ad hoc financial advice. <laughs> oh, no, just, 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 just in general. Okay, well we'll see. Hopefully we'll meet again. But there's a, there's a, 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 um, there's a, a there are two um, Japanese stocks. One called NGK Spark Plug and the other called Rome, which are both very cheap and have the potential to make, you know, two, three, four times your money. I'm right that one down. I know you are. <laughs> Just as a follow up to that, do you always make bottom up? Decisions, or what are some of the just more general investment themes or opportunities that you're focused on today? Um, no, I don't just make um, uh, bottom-up decisions. So the the ideas um, that lead me to become very optimistic about Japan are combination of top-down and bottom-up. Um, the we you know on this in this process of, of going from from. Um, from 100 million to uh, to 2 billion, we were we were fortunate enough to get the Asian crisis right. <laughs> so that was exclusively a top down a top down decision, and and we made you know, a great deal of money that that year. Um, so I, the I hes I really hesitate to give these apart from NGK and right, but but the uh, the. I, I think we should in, invest with the expectation of, of rising inflation and rising inflationary expectations. So, I'm not so I'm not so keen on bonds. I'm fairly keen on gold, uh, index-linked, um, in, long-dated UK index-linked bonds are very attractive. Um, that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Um, you uh, you mentioned. Yes, I strongly believe that. Yeah. Hedge funds 
uh, on the one hand, sort of regular charge, global macro centers, particularly to emerging markets. But on the other hand, the likes of George Soros and Julian Robertson didn't actually exactly help the situation it's in true. 1997 with the time. So what do you think overall the effect of hedge funds has been on emerging markets? Well, I mean, you know, I think the, to say a couple of things first, the um, hedge fund managers are, are, and myself included, are about the most, in, in a certain sense, are about the most conservative people you'll ever meet, in that they take the institutions as given, okay, and then trade around them. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't, um, I'm sure that George Soros would, didn't lose a moment's sleep in um, you know, when when he made money out of out of the uh, uh, the Thai bar collapse or the or, you know, or the or the fall in um, in pound sterling after uh, in in 19, 1992. So they take the view that this you know this is a, a game for um, it, it's risky and sometimes they lose but on on balance they, they they've won. Uh, so that I don't think that's an amoral position or an immoral position. It's just they accept the institutions as, as they're presented. Um, there is no doubt, in my view, over time, that the um, uh, financial services have, have helped uh, the emerging markets. I mean, they have been an enormous source of capital. Um, look, at, look at what's happened in China over the last, um, the last five years. And the, you know, to a certain degree, there was some, there was a, there was a real inevitability about the uh, uh, the Asian crisis. No, in fact, not to a certain degree. It, it, all of these countries, they were supposed to be export-led, having export-led growth, and they all all racked up enormous um, current account deficits, uh, uh, funded through the banking sector. And it was bound, to, it was bound to come, uh, uh, to come amiss. And it did. So, um, but once it, once it happened, the the uh, it was it was the overseas financial sector, financial services group that recapitalised Thailand and Korea and Indonesia. You know, the, the domestic institutions and domestic families were were a absolutely terrified at that juncture. Looking back over your time at um, Sir Robinson, what's the most niche stock you've ever invested in? Oh, I can't. I'm not sure I can answer that. Most niche. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I mean, the just something really odd. Something you probably. Um, what, what do you mean by what, by most niche? Yeah. So, for instance, I was um, an investment banker in East, and one of the companies I had to look at was um, an explosion protection device specialist. Um, oh, the most so highly specialised. Tell you after, I can't, I can't think of it. Think of it. I mean, there. Are, yeah, there's maybe two more questions. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's all yeah. um, I was sorry, I asked the second question. But um, as follow up to my first question, I was wondering how hedge funds um, decide to sponsor things, and because governments and like other institutions have so many like organisations or advisors who like tell them where to sponsor, how to invest things. I was wondering how hedge funds decide we fund the scholarship or we do this and this with our money as philanthropic. Mm, that's a very good question. The um, have you have you read about the Art Foundation? I haven't yet. <laughs> but, <laughs> but but you you might look that up because they um, uh, I'm I'm not part of this because it's it's very ostentatious. But they have a they have a big party every year and. You know, probably in the Ritz, and, and um, they raise twenty or thirty million dollars. And there's a there's a philanthropic foundation there which uh, guides the money that's you know, that, that's uh, uh, that, that's raised. So it's mainly done by outside, like organisations that then use. Yeah, well, that's that's one model, and but the model that that a lot of people use is, is simply to there are a lot of, there's a lot of conservation. You know, wildlife con conservation. Um, 
which actually has some, you know, obvious, obviously has some uh, lifestyle spillovers. Uh, or they, or they give, give money to their, their colleges and schools. Because, and that's an incredibly efficient way of, of doing it, you know, because the, the um, you know, Lincoln College and Keeble and Oxford already have the institutions to, to challenge. Any more? I was in a heated debate with this gentleman sitting next to me before your talk about the um, flight equality of capital out of China, but based on the back of slow down growth, the growing property bubble, and shadow banking. Do you have an opinion on that? Or in other terms, would you invest in China now? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, so two things there. The, um, if I was, um, the right thing for the Chinese authorities to do is to free up the capital account and, ab and abandon exchange controls. And then there'll be no more capital flight. It's just like Margaret Thatcher, when she, you know, when, when she abandoned, the first thing she did when she came into power in 1979 was abandon exchange controls. But once, you, once you know you can get the money out, you, know, you, know, you don't have to get it out fast. And actually, money come, you know, starts starts to, to you know, overseas capital starts start, uh, came came back to the UK very rap very rapidly. So that's that's the first. Thing. There is at the moment a large capital flight from 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 China, um, because the you know the scale of some of the some of the corruption there has just been gargantuan, as you know, the, and it's associated with the SOEs, the state-owned enterprises, and and I think that they are not worth investing in, either in the short term or the medium term. The banks may be something of an exception, but the, but the private sector companies in, um, in China have been some of the most interesting and, and, uh, and profitable investments that, you've, you know, that, that we've seen over the last five years. And those, you know, they, those are companies that you want to pay a lot of attention to. So if I was going to invest in China, the way I invest in China and, and the way increasingly other people invest in China is to invest in, in private sector businesses and leave the, the SOEs alone. Does that answer your question yes. a bit? Yes. So with the growth of computer science, have you noticed maybe um, hedge funds becoming increasingly dependent upon programming and sort of maths in preference of old techniques of investment? Uh, another good question. Not really. Okay. The um, there are uh, there are there are firms that that only um, use their proprietary algorithms to, to trade. So two that you might have heard of are Winston, which is immensely successful here in, in the UK, and uh, a firm called Renaissance. In, um, in the US, which doesn't take outside investors. It's so successful. Um, and it's, it's run by the ex-Treasury um, uh, Secretary of, uh, of the US. I can't remember what his, what his name is. So you don't see like a long-term shift to purely... Uh, well, I mean, to, to a degree, but, but there are firms that specialize in these, where, whereas there, there are other firms that, that are, if you like, more old-fashioned, like ours, which you know, you, you need maths aptitude, but but you do, certainly don't need high order maths at all. Yeah. Um, do you see, uh, on, a, kind of on the back of this question really, um, traders, which is I guess the feed pool for a lot of hedge funds, uh, of, of, the, of the talent, do you not see those professions being replaced gradually by algorithms because it's cheaper it's sometimes more profitable, and, and and also they're quicker to respond. And it, and well, you're, I mean, you're right, but the, in, in in a sense, but it, it's something that applies much more to um, sell side analysts or you know, sell side businesses, sure. okay? Because they used to make their money through the touch, through the, the, the commission between what you know, what you sold. But it can be done much more much more rapidly on. Um, on the dark pools, which is, which is what, it's, what it's called. Mm. So, I mean, is it a d disruptive technology? Yes. 
uh, it's, it's most disruptive to, to, to what were the old stockbrokers and the, 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 um, uh, the, uh, the bulge bracket banks who, who make markets in, in these securities rather, rather than investors. Well, I guess you know, the, the Goldman Sachs, the Morgan Stanley's of the world, that have these you know, huge desks, um, ranks of people all over the world. In 50 years' time, it's quite feasible to see how those, could, those jobs could be actually pushed, away, uh, pushed out. Well, I mean, you're, and it, you're, you're absolutely right, but it's, then not, it's, and it's then not 50 tentacle. years. It's not 50 years. <laughs> so, so Goldman bought, um, bought a, 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 a specialty trader in, um, in New York for six and a half billion dollars. Um, in 2005 and sold it probably back to the management last month for 200 million. You know, the, the old, you know, open outcry way of doing it just, just isn't, no, longer, no longer makes sense. Mm. All right, everyone, thank you so much for your attention. I hope you've been some help um, and we can discuss more later. Thank you. <laughs>